Welcome back, one and all, to another Space News Rundown with me. We have so much to discuss regarding rocket builder SpaceX and their Starship, rocket builders Astra and Firefly with their new prototype test vehicles, and law officers Blue Origin, who launched some experiments for a client that they're simultaneously suing. Interesting stuff. So, intros and salutations aside, let's begin with the Starship update. <laughs> So yes, Starship, this is a very exciting project for everyone. Even people who aren't really interested in spaceflight are almost universally captivated by the Saturn V. To date, this is the biggest and most powerful rocket ever launched to orbit. But as amazing as this incredible feat of engineering is, it looks like the Saturn V's days as the king of rockets are numbered. When we saw Ship 20 stacked on top of Booster 4, it officially became the tallest rocket ever built, and now it's only a matter of time before SpaceX launches this monstrous vehicle, finally dethroning the Saturn V after over 50 years at the top. Beginning with the rocket's upper stage, Ship 20, progress has been a little bit slow these past few weeks, at least for SpaceX that is. Just just mere weeks ago, we were seeing awesome sights like the fully stacked Booster 4 and Ship 20 launch vehicle, and of course the massive launch integration tower rose from the ground over the course of just a few weeks. So we were a little bit spoiled in that regard. But that's not to say that SpaceX haven't been incredibly hard at work, despite there not being quite as many uh, visible things happening from the angle that the photographers can get. For starters, Ship 20's heat shield tiles, or TPS tiles, have been extensively worked on for the past few weeks. This isn't just for TPS installation, but also for inspection. Zooming in on the photos, we can see that most of the tiles have OK written on them, which we can all assume means that they've passed inspection, and then there are some that have either a green or a red strip attached to them. It's not clear what the colour scheme means exactly. It could mean that the red ones need replacing completely, while the green ones only need to be checked and possibly realigned. It's hard to say, but over the past few weeks, the number of colour stripped tiles has been decreasing and the number of okayed tiles have been increasing, which hopefully means that the launch date for the Starship orbital flight test is closing in. It'll probably be in October at the earliest before we see the launch, since SpaceX still have to wait over a month before they can even apply for a launch license, and there's still quite a lot of ground that needs to be covered first. The re-entry phase of Starship will be by far the biggest obstacle that SpaceX will need to overcome. At Mach 25 speeds, the heating effects will be absolutely brutal, and it's vital that the TPS tiles can hold up. One of the biggest differences between the Starship's thermal protection system compared with that of the Space Shuttle is the much greater simplicity. The Space Shuttle had thousands of wholly unique tiles, making maintenance and replacement extremely long-winded and a big reason why the Space Shuttle was never really a rapidly reusable or or a particularly cost-effective vehicle. Starship, on the other hand, is covered in mostly identical tiles thanks to its simpler shape. It's only really the trickier part, such as the flaps and the hinges, where a unique shape is required. This simplicity will hopefully be a huge factor in achieving SpaceX's goal of having Starship be a truly rapidly reusable vehicle with as little as 24 hours between flights eventually. And I wouldn't be too worried about Ship 20's TPS tiles taking a long time to sort out. This is, after all, a prototype vehicle only, and of course this is the first time a Starship has been built with this many tiles. It's kind of quaint thinking about how we all thought SN15 had lots of tiles attached to it during its flight. Speaking of SN15, by the way, we learned from a recent NASA spaceflight article why it lit two of its engines for its landing rather than just one. It was because the vehicle's liquid methane header tank had a lower pressure than normal, so the ship ignited two of its engines to avoid an SN8 style hard landing. I don't really have much more to say on that, but hey, it's new information so I thought I'd share it. For now, there's currently no word on when we could expect Ship 20's testing campaign to begin, but hopefully it'll be soon. While Ship 20 has been fairly quiet, we did see some active testing down at the launch site for another test vehicle. This was a small test tank that looks quite reminiscent of BN2 and SN7, built from parts of the GSE-4 tank. It was rolled out and underwent cryo testing. It's unclear what the exact purpose of this testing was, but hopefully SpaceX got the results that they wanted. Moving on to the launch tower, Ocean Cam spotted these very interesting parts arriving at the site that look like they could well be part of Mechazilla, the giant arm that'll catch both the Super Heavy booster and the Starship upper stage. The other arm for the tower will be the QD, or Quick Disconnect arm, which will be used for fueling the rocket and of course will provide stability to the vehicle. It was moved towards 
of the launch tower and was then lifted on Sunday and was then subsequently attached to the tower, crossing a big milestone for SpaceX there. Now, normally on Space This Week, we're used to seeing Starbase from the ground, but this week we had a very unique perspective shared by Elon on Twitter. The crew of Inspiration4 did a flyby of the base in jets. <laughs> Inspiration4 is, of course, an upcoming Falcon 9 mission launching on the 15th of September. It'll be a three-day flight that'll be a human space flight to orbit with exclusively private citizens on board. The Crew Dragon capsule will feature a glass dome where its docking port would normally be, as in this mission the vehicle won't be docking with the International Space Station. Interestingly, this will make it the first time that humans have flown to space without the primary objective to visit a space station since the 2009 Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. Interesting that this mission is coming right off the back of Branson and Bezos' suborbital tourism missions. Out of the three, which would you ride? For me, honestly, I think I'd still pick Virgin Galactic. I have a pretty weak stomach and I don't think I'd personally last more than a couple of minutes in space without vomiting, but let me know your preference down below. And hey, while you guys are down there, you know I gotta ask you to like the video to help support what we do here. The algorithm is a fickle beast and the likes go a very long way. And of course, subscribing is also a great way to get notified of these videos the moment they go live. Given how fast space news evolves and changes, the videos really are enjoyed best on their day of upload for maximum relevance. Anyway, back down at the Boca Chica build site, we saw Booster 4 have some Raptor engines attached to its thrust puck. This is likely just for fit testing rather than in preparation for a static fire test. Remember that this booster will still need to undergo pressure and cry proofing first, at least based on the steps in testing that SpaceX have taken for previous Starship prototypes. Brendan Lewis once again supplies us all with these brilliant infographics on what the status of production is at the Starbase site. As you can see, GSE tank number 8 is coming along very well, which is exciting news as this is the final tank required for the orbital launch site, and once it's finished and installed, SpaceX will have the capacity to support a fully stacked Booster 4 and Ship 20 for their historic orbital flight test, so this is a very critical milestone for SpaceX to cross. Now with all that said and done, that's pretty much it for the main happenings down at Starbase this week. Over the next few days, we should start to see more work on both Ship 20's heat shield tiles and with the tower's quick disconnect arm and Mechazilla. Make sure you tune in next Monday for my discussion around this, but for now, let's move along and see what else we saw take place last week, beyond Starship. <laughs> Last week played host to four orbital rocket launches. It began with two Chinese Long March launches, both on the 24th of August. The first was a Long March 2C, which launched three communication satellites into polar low Earth orbit from the Chuquan Launch Center. The second was a Long March 3BE, which launched just the one satellite, a Chinese Signals Intelligence satellite, into geosynchronous Earth orbit. Both Chinese launches were a success, and all four satellites are now operational in their respective orbits. The next launch we saw last week wasn't quite as successful, but it was much more entertaining. Yes, this was Astra's third flight test of their small sat launcher, Rocket 3. This time, we got a proper live stream for the launch that was co-produced with NASA Spaceflight. As you can see, shortly after ignition, one of the rocket's engines failed, causing the vehicle to drift quite a distance horizontally, actually reaching negative vertical velocity according to the stream data, before beginning vertical ascension. It was a valiant recovery and certainly a familiar sight to any Kerbal players, I'm sure. But of course, with a dramatically reduced thrust to weight ratio, there was simply no way this rocket was going to make it to orbit. Instead, it continued on its deviated trajectory for approximately two and a half minutes before it was terminated by Range Safety, who presumably waited for the rocket to clear land before ordering main engine shutdown. The rocket and its instrumentation payload for the United States Space Force crashed into the ocean shortly afterward. A real shame overall, especially given how close Astra were to success with the previous Rocket 3 launch, which managed to cross the Kármán line, but hopefully this will be a good learning and data gathering experience for the company, so that future launches will go a little bit more vertically. <laughs> the fourth launch of the week was a SpaceX Falcon 9, which took to the skies on the 29th of August from the Kennedy Space Center. This was something of a return to flight for the Falcon, as it's been a little while since we last saw a Falcon 9 launch. The primary payload was the Cargo Dragon, which was the commercial resupply service mission to the International Space Station. 
Also along for the ride were eight CubeSats for a variety of customers. The Falcon 9 first stage touched down on SpaceX's brand new autonomous spaceport drone ship, a short fall of Gravitas, the first landing supported by the vessel, and here's hoping it maintains its so far 100% success rate. We also had a suborbital launch last week from the law offices of Blue Origin, who I'm told also sometimes build rockets in between legal cases. <laughs> this launch was an uncrewed flight that carried 18 commercial payloads inside the crew capsule, 11 of which were NASA supported, which is ironic given that the company is also suing NASA. Speaking of Blue Origin, we also finally got glimpses of Project Jarvis. This was a project announced earlier in the year, which would be a stainless steel reusable upper stage for the fictional New Glenn launch vehicle, which looks very Starship to me. <laughs> as much as I dislike the management of Blue Origin, I have to give big respect to all the talented engineers working at the firm, and I really hope we do get another fully reusable launch vehicle to compete with SpaceX's Starship. We're definitely a few years away from, well, New Glenn at the pace we're going, but hopefully this means that we may get some cool Starship-style flight tests to marvel at while development proceeds. Anyway, those were all the major events from last week that I wanted to mention, so now let's move along to our final segment, all the events expected to take place over the next seven days. The first launch doesn't have a confirmed date and time, but Rocket Lab maintained that they want to launch their Electron mission, Love at First Insight, in late August, which means either today or tomorrow. <laughs> this will be the second of four dedicated launches for Black Sky, an American geospatial intelligence service, and the Electron will carry two of Black Sky's Earth observation satellites to low Earth orbit. There's every chance that this mission will fly in September, but we'll just have to wait and see for this one. The next launch is a very exciting one. This will be on the 3rd of September and will be the first flight of the Firefly Alpha, a commercial small sat launch vehicle. Looking a bit like a plus-sized Electron, the rocket will be carrying 26 CubeSat rideshare payloads, which will be launched via Firefly's Dedicated Research and Education Accelerator Mission, or DREAM, program. Their experimental orbit transfer vehicle will also be tested on this flight. It's certainly a bold move to carry so many commercial payloads on a rocket that's never been flown before, but with an engineering team who've come from SpaceX, Virgin, and Blue Origin, there's definitely a lot of minds with plenty of experience in rocket building behind this vehicle. A big good luck to Firefly. There aren't any other launches planned for this week, but we should be seeing a roughly 7-hour EVA at the International Space Station by Russian cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov, who will work on the newly docked Nyorka module, as well as retrieve and replace two exposure experiments from the Poisk module and bring them inside. But those are all the major events that I wanted to talk about this week, which I guess wraps up today's episode of Space This Week. I do hope you guys have enjoyed the ride and enjoying the new format. It's been relatively new, this sort of change up, getting rid of the history segment, changing up kind of the ratio between Starship last week, this week, and, you know, things like that. It seems to have gone down quite well based on the view count suddenly going up. So thank you guys for all liking and subscribing and sharing these videos to get it out to a wider audience. If you want to watch more videos, from me they are now on screen well two of them are now on screen there's also some patrons scrolling on the left thank you so much for your support everyone if you want to join patreon there is also a button on screen and in the description or you can also join the channel get a little badge next to your name and some emojis to spam in the comments and i've waffled on far too long so i'm going to leave it there thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next monday <laughs>